Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another exciting forum. Um, as people are joining in, we'll wait for a few more seconds for people to join in. Uh, we'd love for you to uh, put in your name, where you're joining us from, and what's exciting you about today's session in the chat. Uh, while I speak, it would be lovely to get some more information about where you're joining us from. Uh, at The Circle, we are trying to create a network of schools and after schools across India that are reinventing learning, that are really trying to innovate what schools could look like for children, especially children from low-income communities. And we do that through a two-year intensive incubation for entrepreneurs who want to start their own schools and after schools. And we also have The Circle Labs, where we conduct a lot of short-term programming for educators and innovators to get their feet wet and really think deeply about what it means to reinvent and try out a bunch of things throughout the year. Uh, this conversation, this forum with Charut, Charuta and Aditi is an effort to do that as well, to bring together an insightful conversation, something that helps us think differently about what learning could look like, and for all of us to engage in a conversation about what we can take back to our context. We have Charuta Joshi and Aditi Bhatt with us. Uh, I Just before this call, I was discussing a very interesting report with uh, some of my colleagues, and it's a Google report uh, that talks about the future of education. And the first thing, bang in the front of the page, it talks about how uh, children who are children today but will be leaders tomorrow need to be global problem solvers because the world is already throwing so many complex challenges at us. In the future, it will be even more layered, even more complex, even more pressing. So how can we ensure that our children, especially children uh, whom we work with and we hope to serve as children from low-income communities, how can we ensure that they really have a powerful problem-solving lens, especially when it comes to STEM pedagogy. Uh, so Aditi and Charuta will actually walk us through what it means to uh, bring back joy and risk taking and fun into science and math through some real world examples. Uh, if you are uh, practitioners who are in classrooms or working with children right now, today you will actually get to learn about tools and frameworks that you can take back to your classrooms and implement in real time. So stick around for that. We'll also play a fun game right after the intros are done. So I think this will be a very powerful and very packed uh, session today. Over to you, Aditi, for intros. And uh, yeah, everyone just step in and enjoy. Thank you so much, Amina. Hi, everybody. I'm Aditi, and I'm currently building Hoop School, where I'm putting a spin on education through hula hooping and other flow art forms. I see flow arts as a form of bodily problem solving, which is why it's my pleasure to be moderating this conversation with Charuta today, which is about creating joyful spaces of learning in STEM, where students feel confident in their abilities. So uh, to start off our forum discussion, I'd like, to, I'd like to take you through some of my work at Hoop School and what embodied problem solving means to me and my students. So I'll just share my screen, give me a second. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, all right. So to give you a quick look into my background, um, I've been hula hooping since I was six, so that's about uh, 19 years now. I studied computer science engineering and then worked in that industry for two years and then went on to do my master's in human-centered design. And uh, that's where Hoop School really took birth because of the transdisciplinary approach that I was exposed to during my master's. I started to see connections between my hooping practice and math learning and really got to explore and nurture that. And um, what you see on the right here are some flow art forms. I thought the visuals would help um, visualize them better. So in the, initially we have Poi, there's Sanjana, my student, who's just four years old, who's spinning. So the Poi is essentially a prop that has a tennis ball inside a sock. Then there's Devil Sticks, which my friend Alok had come in and sort of facilitated for my kids. It's, um, yeah, it's a tossing of sticks and like a lot of balance mechanics go on there. Then that's a staff, which is essentially a weighted stick. Then there's Fans, which is um, kind of like a mix between hoops, which is what I'm doing in the picture on the left. And uh, there's Dapo, which is like a cloth frisbee. And then I've also included a picture of LED hoops because that's also a very interesting prop where you can see trails and patterns form. So uh, this is a small glimpse into the world of flow arts. What I'm doing in the picture is I'm juggling three hoops and I'm also spinning the hoop on my foot. 
those are my two favorite things to do with hoops so uh, there's a lot of problem solving that goes on when you do this itself so for me to coordinate figure out okay what angle should my foot be in when i'm trying to spin hoops what doesn't come in the way what what does so there are a lot of nice elements of problem solving that i see in connection with hooping and math so uh, that's what i like you like to take you through very quickly today Uh, these are some of the contexts that I've been working with. Uh, the first one was with a group of 13 students where we focused on emotional regulation and um, identifying emotions, what to do with those emotions, how we can regulate them. So we use the hoop as a way of connecting with ourselves and uh, yeah, and, and self-expression. And then came Spinfinity, which, was a, which is still a project that I'm working on. I worked with girls who absolutely despise math, so much to the fact that um, they have this inside joke where they ask me, why is math the worst subject in the world? It's apparently because the textbook is full of problems. So I thought that would be interesting for us to discuss today as well. Uh, I wanted to sort of ease this math anxiety that is so intense with them, try to figure out a new way of exploring math that focuses more on comprehension rather than computation and calculation. I'll show you some of the things that have emerged from that too. I've also worked with neurodiverse kids who have a range of um, disabilities, ranging from learning disabilities, physical disabilities. And over there, we focused on motor cognition development with hula hoops, DAPO, and POI. So that was, that was a great experience for me and for them as well, I hope. I've also done a couple of workshops with the STEM club of Nakshatra Sciences. These are kids who really love STEM. They knew a lot more than I did. And it was a lot of great insights and learnings emerged from there. So yeah, I'll show you a couple of things that have emerged. I would, um, I'm going to be focusing very specifically on the intersection of math and hooping, because I think it uh, presents one of the most challenging yet fascinating aspects of learning insights. My intention was to bring out math learning out of the blackboard. And it's, it's a very 2D, math requires a lot of imagination. And that gets difficult to do in a 2D environment with like a blackboard or paper. So uh, what I think is interesting about this flow arts pedagogy is that you can actually manipulate these objects, move around in space, move different parts of your bodies to really experience these concepts. So I think that's where the magic of this uh, pedagogy lies. So I want to just take you through around two, three examples of student learnings that have come about. So this first story is about a student called Yadul who is uh, hooping over here. This was the last day of my engagement with these students. On the first day, Yadul came up to me and said, Didi, I can't hoop. I have some health problem. He made up some health problem saying that, no, I can't hoop on my waist. So like, excuse me from this one, other things I'll do. And I was also just starting out. So I said, okay, it's fine. Do what you can. And then eventually these kids, every day at the beginning of each session, they would ask me to do a competition for them to see who can hoop the longest. And uh, that competitiveness, I think, really inspired him, that collaboration. And eventually he was the one who won. He, he set the record of 35 minutes for the whole class. And that also was something I had to stop because I said, okay, I have to actually teach you what I intend to teach for today. So uh, yeah, 35 minutes was how much time I gave them. And he was able to hoop until that point. So um, some STEM concepts that can be covered um, are things like angular momentum, ratio and proportion, rates of change. I've also tried this for counting. The girls who didn't like counting in math at all, when they try to make these micro improvements, they try to see how many they can improve with each iteration. And I think that's something that problem solving, that's a very critical problem solving skill as well. Then even persistence and the power of consistency. Some, the amount of concentration it takes to just improve is a lot. And I think that's something that really got improved throughout this process. And patience, practice and repetition. They saw the power of like those small micro adjustments and just keeping at it. And it was still engaging and fun enough for them to do that. So this was one anecdote. The second one, uh, this is, I'm teaching them a diameter dance. We came up with this dance where you hold the diameter of the hoop throughout. Uh, this was again for the girls who do not like math at all. And what we did was I asked them to na name these tricks themselves. So these, some of these tricks are very complicated names like vertical isolations. And I noticed a similar pattern in math where um, as soon as I see a math term, everybody gets scared. So then what I do is I ask them to say it in their own words, give it their own name. So some of the rings, they called it Saturn ring, star ring, angel. They came up with these really nice names, which made the concepts and the tricks less scary. So uh, one really nice thing that emerged from this one was that I asked them to draw the shapes that the uh, tricks are making, like the pattern and the shape. And then one girl, uh, and I asked them to associate superpowers to them. So uh, I said that, okay, when you do this trick, can you think of like a superpower that could be activated when you do this? 
So one of these girls came up to me and said, oh, with this move where we um, rotate the hoop, we can uh, spin back time. So she came up with time travel, invisibility cloaks. They came up with so many things. And she said to me at the end of the day that, Didi, I didn't even know that so many, that my brain was capable of thinking so creatively. And that's, I think, the intention of my pedagogy. And I'm sure for a lot of you as well, is for them to feel capable and surprised by their own capabilities in a very pleasant way. So uh, these are some of the problem solving skills that I thought can come through with these activities. And then this was a balance race, a partner balance race, where um, they I asked them to collaboratively balance a hoop with different body parts. So these are some diagrams that came through when they were doing this. So I noticed that instead of asking them to compute a number or something like that, asking them to draw for these kids, really changed the way that they were approaching math. They no, no longer saw it as like something they were computing or solving exactly like a number, but they understood the concept. They asked questions around it. They formed hypothesis. They tested fast and without fear of failing. They tried out multiple ways and perspectives of doing this. So yeah, that was something really great as well. And then finally, one small anecdote that I would like to end with is that I this was with um, the STEM club. I showed them this move, which is called a windmill, and I asked them to draw the pattern. And one of the girls actually came up to me and said, oh, you know what, this actually is a sine wave simulation. And I hadn't thought of that myself. <laughs> and I, I, whenever I do this move now, I, 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 I never thought of it before and it just surprised me so much and stayed with me. So I, I think pattern connection is also something that comes through with this kind of a pedagogy. And yeah, it's just really exciting to see how these kids respond to this because I would have thought of it in one different way, but then their responses are completely surprising and, and quite um, engaging as well for me. Uh, and yeah, thank you for um, sitting through my different anecdotes. I'd love to collaborate and connect and build this further. So if you have any thoughts, any um, if you'd like to do some workshops together or anything, feel free to connect. And I think these details will also be sent out later. But uh, yeah. So uh, this, this deck also was something that came out of a conversation that Charita and I had. I think when I was talking to Charita earlier, a lot of things sort of clicked for me. And I started thinking in terms of problem solving and realizing that these are the capabilities that my kids are also developing. So I hope that today's forum also does something similar for you, where you start thinking in those terms and take back things to your classrooms, whatever form that might be, whether you're from a school or just in your general daily life. And on that note, I'd like to introduce Charita and her team. I'll stop sharing my screen. So uh, Charuta is the founder of Problem Solvers Lab, which is dedicated to empowering young people with the skills and mindsets to tackle unfamiliar problems confidently. Her team has piloted programs in mathematical problem solving for middle schoolers, data analytics for college students, and professional problem solving for nonprofit employees gaining critical insights into effective strategies. She's currently a senior advisor at ByteLearn, and she's previously led a team of mathematical ed math education specialists, such as head of curriculum. Uh, with over 11 years of experience as an educator in New York public schools, she excels in curriculum development and educational innovation. Charita also contributes to Indian nonprofits in, uh, in product design, fundraising, and curriculum development, leveraging her extensive experience to drive meaningful impact. And we also have Alisha Pathan, who is a facilitator for our communities who's also going to be joining us for the discussion. And I'm so excited to hear from both of them about the work they've done on ground. So over to you both. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much, Aditi. And I loved uh, looking at your uh, deck and listening uh, with passion about the, the passion with which you're talking about hoops and problem solving. And I would like to collaborate with you and bring in these activities into Problem Solvers Lab. So let's talk more. Yes, uh, I'd love that. So as Aditi said, my name is Charuta Joshi. I worked for about 11 years. I founded uh, Problem Solvers Lab. Uh, it's not been a year yet. Uh, this was last October. Uh, let me take, I want to uh, take you through an experience uh, that stuck in my mind. Uh, I talked to people about a problem. Uh, how many handshakes will be there? when uh, there are 100 people in a room and everybody shakes hands with each other. So let me share my screen because uh, I am a, give me, yeah. So how many handshakes occur when each person in a room for, of 100 people shakes hands with every, uh, every other person, right? So 
it was interesting to see the different reactions that people had uh, adults and students uh, and let me here we go <laughs> and the reason i talk about this experience in this problem is there was fear there was lack of confidence there was a feeling that hey i don't even know where to start and i'm not good at these kind of things and this is not for me and that feeling of that lack of confidence that i don't even know what's the entry point into this problem that has really stuck into my mind uh it's, it does not mean that everybody should be able to start uh, solve problems like this but it means that for me what's important is any problem that you're given you should be able to you should be willing to get your hands dirty try something experiment and fail and learn from that experiment so that's kind of the like the big idea in uh, problem solvers lab that you're given a problem and you try a bunch of experiments in uh, and learn from those experiments so uh i believe that problem solving especially quantitative problem solving is a foundational skill for uh, everybody and when i talk to people and talk about problem solving many of them turn oh yeah it is for the higher order students or the students who are doing already well inko to subtraction or division bhi nahi aata unko ye problems kya sikhayenge i actually believe quite differently i think that problem solving is a skill is a foundational skill for students for all students and for all adults and the second belief is that problem solving can actually be learned there is a, a way you can craft lessons uh, such that everybody learns problem solving it may be at a different level of sophistication but everybody learns uh, problem solving and the way we see this happening is by instilling joy and a sense of security giving them a uh, set of skills and tools and mindsets which leads to confidence and the ultimate goal is for students or any for learners to take intellectual risk and higher effort uh, and the reason this goal is important uh, of intellectual risk and higher effort because in any problem solving uh, in in the real world requires us to take risks to try to fail and to try again and that's why the the willingness and the security to take intellectual risk is really really important for, as an end goal for us uh the specific skills that we are looking at that we hone down because there are various ways you can define problem solving right it can be problem solving in the community it can be problem solving specifically related to science we chosen to focus on the four computational skills of decomposition that is breaking a problem apart pattern recognition uh starting with symbols but then eventually coming to hey i have seen, seen this kind of problem before i have seen this kind of situation before and therefore these are the kind of solutions that have worked let me try these here abstraction which is saying how can i uh take all these experiences and generalize let go of the details and generalize and come up with a more abstract understanding of this uh idea and algorithmic thinking is how can i follow a process but how can i also create a process uh, for somebody else for a uh, uh, and i am finding that more and more the skill these four skills are really important in uh, in almost every job right and the two enablers that we are seeing are communication and collaboration uh, skills that is um, being able to make your thinking visible and being able to work with other people to build on each other's ideas uh i'm going to briefly take you through these uh six uh what i call as levers for our problem solving but not spend a whole lot of time because i do want to talk with alicia and have a conversation with aditi and through our conversations i want to cover four problems so the first point is about engaging problems and i want to cover four problems uh that we have actually worked with with students one is the handshake problem the other is desmos i don't know if you have heard of desmos it's like a beautiful graphing calculator i know these two words might not go together in your head but it's really a beautiful uh, uh, uh tool that brings uh, concepts to life 
So one is handshake problem, second is Desmos. The third is a game of NIM that we are going to play together. And the fourth is a data art activity that we did with eighth grade students. Um, what we do in our sessions is letting students explore and experiment and mess around with ideas and build on each other's ideas and make mistakes, what they call mistakes, and let go of their mistakes and learn from those, right? Which is where the exploring and uh, experimenting becomes really important. But given that these are like fourth graders to 10th graders, uh, what I have learned uh, through my 11 years of teaching is you need to provide some structure, otherwise students feel really lost. And that is where the scaffolded activities come in, where how can we provide enough structure and scaffolding is a way of like providing support, but only enough support so that within which they it allows them to do this experimentation and uh, exploration. Uh, and we'll talk about making things, uh, thinking visible, and I'll show you some artifacts that they have created. My goal is to, in every um, sessions that uh, we work with with students, they create an artifact, which is either a creation, a new creation based on some concepts that we have introduced, or it is an artifact that shows how they have solved the problem, a poster or a video. And the last, the most important pillar of the work that we do is our facilitators. And that is where I would like to bring in Alicia. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So just to give you some context, uh, we have tied up with a bunch of partners in uh, India. There is Akanksha. So we work with students in an after-school setting, either on the weekends or during vacation. Uh, we've tied up with Aid India, which is an organization that operates in uh, Tamil Nadu. We will be working in schools where we'll be doing a push-in once a week for one and a half hours. Uh, we've uh, tied up with, uh, partnered with Panha Communities, uh, which is an after-school center that's based in Pune. Um, then with People Schools and with Avanti Fellows. Now, Alish, uh, what we do with a bunch of, um, in Akanksha, we do a lot of the facilitation ourselves. It's like our lab for figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And we then partner with other organizations where we um, train their facilitators, right? Uh, and these facilitators could be really young, like college students, or it could be for teachers who have been teaching for a while, but more often than not in a traditional way. So that's like the range of the facilitators that we train. And now I want to invite Alicia, who is one of our, possibly our youngest facilitator that we have trained. She uh, works with Panna Communities. Uh, she's just finished 12th grade and has started uh, her uh, college. And she works with, uh, in Panna Communities with, 50 students along with a colleague of hers. And every week they uh, implement two hours of problem solving sessions. So uh, Aditi, can you uh, spotlight Alicia? And Alicia, would it be possible to actually turn your video on? <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia. There you go. So Alicia. Oh, and there, we, this is a constant battle that Alicia and I are having. I have been trying to convince her that she does not need to call me ma'am. Uh, there is no hierarchy in Problem Solvers Lab, but it's not a battle. I think we will come to a good solution that is acceptable to both of us. That's what problem solving is, right? Uh, so welcome, Alicia, and thank you for joining us in this conversation. Uh, I would like to start with a question for you, uh, Alicia. Um, when you start, I would love for you to give uh, for you to give a brief introduction to yourself, and then talk about what has been your experience and how do you see problem solvers classrooms different from other classrooms that you have experienced. Um, yes, and thank you for that introduction. Was mine, and thank you for inviting me to the meeting. Um, to begin with, I I am going with admission into computer engineering for first year. I just completed my twelfth uh, uh, in science. 
and I am working at Samaj Communities as a mentor where uh, I teach TYS students, the TYS is Kanha uh, Young Scholar, uh, which is where, where we are preparing these students for, you know, competitive examinations like scholarship, for Olympiads, then there's after academy examination, then there's government scholarship examination, so we are preparing them for that. Uh, we are training kids from 5th to 8th standard and similarly, we are working with them to uh, for the problem solver lab. Yes, and to answer your question, how is problem solver lab different from a regular classroom? Um, to be honest, I come from a regular classroom where like each natural science, they get a finite answers and a finite ways to solve the problem. Like if you use this problem, then there's this, if this is a problem and there's this particular problem has this formula and there's only one answer to it. There's no other answer. So I always thought that each problem has only one way of solving it and only one answer of finding out the solution. But uh, when solving problem, uh, when, uh, you know, when I started doing problems for the lab, I realized that um, each problem is different and there are unique ways to solve it. Also, when kids do it together, it is amazing how kids uh, solve each problem differently. Like if there are 20 students in the classroom, there will be 20 different ways of solving the same problem. And it is more amazing to see that how every kid empathizes with each, everybody. Like they don't fight. They like the answer in the age, the answer really is in yoga. They want to listen to each other. They want to find out how it is. How it is. How it is. Explain me how it is. 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 So it is nice to see how um, there are different ways of solving the problem. I can see that. And there's creativity and there's innovation. There's also a lot of collaboration among the students and in myself. Thank you so much, Alicia. I think one of the things that you had mentioned to me uh, earlier was like how uh, in your experience and for most students, they think that there is a formula that exists and that somebody uh, hundreds of years ago created that formula and our job is to uh, execute that formula and how students are now amazed that they are able to come up with a formula themselves and their formulas might look different and it uh, but they are developing that uh, formula uh, alicia how have you grown as a facilitator and as a problem solver through the work that you're doing with uh, Problem Solvers Lab. Just to give context to everybody, uh, we have a weekly training session which lasts about an hour or two hours. We are playing around with how long those sessions would be. We give assignments uh, to the facilitators. They go through a training and after every session with students, uh, facilitators fill a reflection journal because in our minds reflection uh, is an important part of understanding yourself and understanding your problem solving process uh, so Alicia does all of that every week so Alicia through this process how have you grown as a facilitator and problem solver uh, yes as a problem solver I would say um like, uh, I come from a place where teamwork is not appreciated very much, where the individual work is very much appreciated. Like, even in school life, um, if we did some work, so I said, you should do it. How did you do it? I said, you should do it. I said, you should do it. I said, you should do it. If somebody said that I did it individually, I don't know why that person was appreciated very much. So I thought that if I have a problem, I need to solve it on my own and not ask people to do it together with me. And similarly, problem solving lab has most of the activities which are to be done in pair or to be done in work. So I was kind of doubtful if it will actually work, if it, if it should actually bring themselves uh, into the problem. But it is surprising that when people come together, there are different opinions, there are different perspectives of looking at the same problem and how uh, they try to do it together. So even as a problem solver, if I have a problem now, I don't try to do it again. I try to seek for advices, I try to ask for suggestions, and I solve those problems. And as a facilitator, I would say the most important thing for me is classroom management. Because uh, they are doing all of the activities uh, together. They, they go from here and there. And there. They, they are not on their faces. Now, but I have learned few tricks and tricks by which I make them certain in the place in just 10 or 5 seconds. So it is amazing how I am handling the class now. And another, I would say, is patience. 
because uh, they are kids of course they do all kind of things they say all kinds of things they will do what you can't even imagine of so now i'm trying to deal with them in patience and listen to them ki kya ho gaya kuch hua kya kaise hua kya hua and i am trying to solve everything calm them uh, um you know uh, with patience and uh, another thing is i am trying to learn new, new things i want to learn like abhi wo nahi hai ki mujhe nahi aata to mujhe nahi aata abhi aise nahi aata hai to mujhe seekhna hai aur main seekhungi to main samne wale ko bhi sikha sakta hu is tarike se okay thank you so much alisha that was uh, beautiful i uh, i remember that you told me yesterday you know when there is something new that you come up na agar na you feel less intimidated and you feel ki acha kuch to main try kar sakti hu bhale hi correct ho ya na ho main kuch to koshish karke and then i will take inputs from other people um uh, alisha anything else that you would like to say uh, before we move on to our game of nim Um, uh, ma'am, I would like to uh, say about the training sessions. Uh, first of your training sessions are very amazing and they are very well planned and uh, properly managed. I want to learn that from you. I would say. And uh, another thing is, I am getting to learn so many new riddles and activities which I might have not even heard of. And uh, during the training sessions, I think I improve. Uh, I have always been that person who does not uh, answers unless I am being called. But now your training sessions, जब भी कुछ होता है, I I am like मुझे पहले आंसर करना है, मेरे पहले कोई नहीं करता, I am learning to take that initiative myself कि नहीं, ऐसे मैं जाऊँगी मेरे पास जिसको भेजना है भेजो, नहीं first में तो मुझे second जाने, मुझे last में जाने, so I am learning more. Amazing, Alicia. That's uh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Alicia, for taking time. Alicia probably is busier than I am, uh, given that she is working uh, full time at Pana and doing college full time. So thank you for taking the time, Alicia, to talk to the people here. Thank you so much. So here is what we are going to do. It's uh, it's beautiful to hear uh, work with Alicia, and I see so much potential. uh in the facilitators so i want to talk about how the range of the facilitators it is really uh, a whole range just like the whole range of students that we work with in that we have students who like alisha said are preparing for entrance exams there are students who are doing really well and then there is a whole mixed bag of students which is what i actually really enjoy because when students of different uh interests and skill levels uh because i don't call them abilities i say that those those are their current skill levels when they work with each other uh they really learn a lot from uh, each other and that is our hope at problem solvers lab i want to actually uh, aditi do we have time for a game of nim yeah i think we do let's let's go for it okay yeah theek hai uh let me share my screen and i want to introduce this game of nim there are various versions to this game and i'm talking about this game of nim because that's a game so in the work that we do we do games puzzles open ended problems and this is one of the games where you can actually come up with a strategy yeah and students over a period of time come up with a strategy for winning this game but it's very simple in its setup you don't need to buy expensive things so here is how this game is played it's called one to nim and the played with two people on your turn you can either there are 10 points that you start with on your turn you can pick either one point or you can pick two points no more than that no not zero points not three coins you can pick either one coin or two coins and the winner is the person who picks the last coin yeah coin or coins if they are picking up two coins uh simple okay so now my question is who wants to play this game with me I will I would love for a volunteer to play this game with me. You just have to unmute yourself and tell me whether you want to pick one or two. Uh, 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 uh Amina are they allowed uh, are they able to unmute themselves? Yes, yes they okay. are. Beautiful. We love some volunteers from the audience. Just come off of mute and we'll uh, get along with the game. Okay, can I? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I see. Harshita. Yes. 
Okay. Harshita, thank you for volunteering. And do you want to go first or do you want to go second? Uh, I can go first. Okay. Uh, and just to, so that I know, have you played this game before? No, I haven't. Huh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So, since it's your turn, you can either pick a uh, one coin or two coins. What would you like to do? Uh, pick two coins. Pick two coins. Here we go. Okay. Um, yeah. You know what? It's my turn now. I'm going to follow suit. And I'm actually also going to pick two coins. What would you like to do next, Arshita? Harshita? Uh, I'll pick two coins again. You are picking two coins again. Okay, then. Arshita, I must warn you that I've played this game several times. <laughs> so don't feel bad, okay? Yeah. Okay, and I'm picking one coin. Okay, I'll pick two coins again. You pick two coins again. And then since I'm the, I picked this coin and that's how, and so I win because I picked the last one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. yeah. So this first game is less about winning and losing. It's about making, it's about clarifying the rules, right? And that's what you would do in front of a class. Like you could pick somebody and say, this is, I don't know if you'll win or lose, but it's about uh, clarifying the game. Ashina, do you want to play again uh, or play with somebody else? Sure. Okay. We need one more volunteer. Con Aya. Okay, Yogita. There we go. Okay. Um, since Yogita is playing, I'm sorry, Yogita. Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. Uh, so Yogita, do you want to go first, or do you want to go second? Uh, I'll be happy to go first. Okay. बोलिए फिर आपको क्या लेना है? One coin. One coin. Okay, then. And Yogita, uh, Harshita, what do you want to take? Uh, two coins. Two coins. Uh, what's the best way? The closest ones are here. Two coins. Okay. Harshita, you go next. I will go with two coins. Two coins. Okay. Harshita, what about you? Uh, I pick one coin. One coin. Yeah. Yogita, I will go with one coin. Go with one coin. Ooh, trap has been set. Yeah. Uh... Okay, one coin. <laughs> so, so now you get a sense of the game. And what you would do is students will actually, right now it was more competitive, right? and students were playing against each other, then what you would do is actually change the game to make it more collaborative. To say, okay, how do we actually explore this? And we break down the problem to say, what if there was only one coin? What if there were two coins? What would, should we do if there were three coins? So now in the classroom, Harshita and Yogita would not be actually competing with each other. They would actually collab collaborate with each other to come up with a list of strategies. If one coin, what will we do? Three, four, five, six. And so this can take over an hour, by the end of which students come up with a set of strategies that they have collaborated together to create like winning strategies that they go home and play with their friends and with their family. So the idea of the classroom is we collaborate and come up with a strategy and then we compete with other people outside. Yeah, so uh, there are lots of uh, games like this. We are looking for games that are small, that don't need a whole lot of setup. Uh, I just wanted to give you uh, one introduction to uh, problems that we do in uh, Problem Solvers Lab. So over to you, Aditi. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. The pitch and even hearing from Alicia, in fact, I'm so um, curious about the classroom management strategies that she was talking about, because I still struggle with that and I'd really like to know. So. <laughs> I will continue that conversation again. But yeah, thank you again. And I hope you all had a good time playing Nim. Uh, Charuta, I'd like to know from you, what led you to start Problem Solvers Lab? And can you tell us a bit about the journey that led you up to this point? Thank you for your question, Aditi. Uh, and I've taught uh, for 11 years as a, a teacher. I went to Bank Street College. I don't know if you've heard. Uh, it's a college in New York City where I did my master's. And I learned about the constructivist approach 
which means that uh, it's opposite of the empty vessel. Empty vessel is where it's a traditional approach where you pour knowledge into mm -hmm. a student. That's the traditional mm -hmm. approach. Constructivist is where we believe that students are capable of creating their own knowledge mm -hmm. and creating their skills. And our job as a facilitator is to provide the experiences and uh, carefully crafted experiences so that they create their knowledge. Yeah. Oh, so, so that is like the foundation of the work that we do. Uh, while teaching, I did a lot of such interesting activities uh, and taught math through such activities. But the highest level of engagement were for problems that were super interesting to students and where they were given enough freedom within uh, constraints. And these were problems that were intellectually rigorous problems. So that made me think that our, our regular curriculum, which is taught in silos, does not really help students to build flexibility, uh, the skills to actually approach problems in different ways and work with each other. Mm -hmm. And can we actually create a curriculum that helps students to uh, develop these problem solving skills? Mm -hmm. And then I also, while work, uh, while I was teaching, I worked with two coaches. I was really fortunate who helped me in thinking through what these kind of problems, how these problems can be crafted. Hmm. So uh, I want to create a curriculum. Many curriculum and teaching styles uh, create uh, fear and lack of confidence, hmm. which leads to poor problem solving. My inspiration is to create a curriculum and an environment that lets uh, well students uh, experience joy hmm. and uh, are able to feel confident about their skills. Absolutely. I also wanted to know about the process that you go through to design these curriculums. Like you mentioned, low floor, high ceiling activities. So, uh, and like you said, um, different skill levels. So how do you um, sort of deal with that? And what are some other um, problem solving tools or frameworks that you could recommend to us to take to our classrooms as well? All right. So low floor, high ceiling is an interesting concept where you low floor is, allows all students to access to be part of the problem. And high mm -hmm. ceiling is you students can take it as far as they want to and are able to. So there's a low floor where students mm -hmm. access and high ceiling where students uh, can take it. So I'll give you the context of the ha handshake problem, right? Mm -hmm. The way we constructed the handshake problem, we started with a notice and uh, we started with an activity in this mm -hmm. case where they go around shaking hands with each other. Everybody wow. can do that, right? Uh, then we say that, okay, can we now, instead of solving this big problem, can we actually make the problem smaller? Mm. And uh, so there is a level of scaffolding involved, yeah. mm. which allows students to then build on their idea. So start, what if there was one person, two people, three people, four people, mm. right? Uh, can you draw and show what those kind of, uh, how many handshakes would be there? So now it's making it truly accessible and mm. then say, okay, can you organize can you make a table? Can you recognize patterns? Can you then generalize and say, what if there were 100 people? And the mm -hmm. level of generalization that students come to can look very different for very different students. Mm -hmm. right? For some students, it will be like, it would, might be more tedious mm -hmm. and they might describe it using words. And yes. for some students, they can come up with a formula which looks algebraic and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It is whatever level you want to get to, whatever ways of representing you want to get to, it's we are okay with that. Mm -hmm. right? And that is the concept of low floor, high ceiling, where then there are also routines like notice and wonder mm -hmm. and what is same, what is different, which allows students access into the problem. Then there is the whole breaking up the problem and uh, building small chunks and then letting mm -hmm. them loose to actually then explore the problem, the whole problem by themselves. Sure. I can share my screen and show you the Desmos yes. uh, uh, activity. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, was? One minute. Huh? Okay. So I don't know if you guys have heard of, uh, folks have heard of Desmos. This is the graphing calculator. Mm -hmm. And what we did in this was, this was with 8th to 10th grade students. They created artwork using functions. 
right? And I can take you through the functions, uh, through the artwork that they had created. Mm -hmm. But our intro to them, because eighth graders had not even heard of functions, they have just started eighth, they have barely like just uh, started eighth grade. Mm -hmm. We showed them this uh, picture and said, what do you notice and what do you wonder about this picture image? And then there were all kinds of different answers about what they notice and what they wonder. Yeah, there are different colors. Oh, I see a grid. I see there are numbers somewhere. And then the next level we would go to is we will give them, so you collect all these noticings and wonderings, and then you give them like the functions that, and let them explore. And then they, oh, this function is doing this and this function is doing this. And so slowly you're building their understanding. Then they explore the functions. Then we say, make a drawing. And now using these functions, mess around and create your own drawing. Hmm. So drawings are like very different levels of sophistication, but we start with a very simple prompt of what is it that you're noticing in this? Okay. Hmm. And I would love to share with you some of the, let me see. Nope, not my Google calendar. <laughs> uh, eight minute, Roku. Uh, one minute. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I want to show you the drawings that students have come up mm. with. They are like beautiful. Mm. Here we go. What I also love about this is that I think feelings of inadequacy also get countered because each of them comes up with something. So they don't feel um, inferior, right? So that's something Absolutely. that's really powerful to create a safe space of joy, especially. Absolutely. And there is no right and wrong there Correct. is no yeah. one right and wrong answer. There is no one right or wrong process. Yeah. It is the process that you develop like we do as adults mm. when we solve problems. Nobody comes to an, us and says, hey, this is the problem and this is what mm. you should follow. Yeah. Because then it's no longer a problem, really. It's a process. Mm. So the these are like the different kinds of uh, uh, images that students created using functions like you know lines, circles, mm. ellipses, sine waves, to which they had no uh, absolute value, to which they had no exposure in the past, but they use like, they really explored. And oh. the best experience for me is when students are, learners are talking about the problem after they leave the classroom. Mm. And they're going home and still thinking about it. That's the best experience uh, in my mind, because now that is sticky. They're still thinking about what, hap what has happened. And I know students went home, they had tablets and continue to work on this. Mm. And all the drawings are so different from each other. So like yeah, you yeah. see each of their own creativities come through, which I think is amazing. And they work with each other. There are beautiful mm. pictures of them sitting next to each other, leaning on each other's shoulder. <laughs> it was beautiful. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Of course, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I also wanted to ask you, how can we help students think about and solve real world issues, especially those of social justice using STEM? I remember you'd shared this other data project as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to share that also with us. Absolutely. Because I yeah. think that gap gets bridged. Um, the power of mathematics, like people say data, numbers don't lie, data is neutral and all. But it's actually very, it, it's rooted in a particular context, which is something people don't often recognize. So I think right. it's, uh, that's where this question came from for me. So making math, making classroom relevant is one of the important objectives of mm. uh, Problem Solvers Lab. And there are two experiments that we have done so far, both related mm. to data for now. Uh, one was in a New York City public school. We worked with uh, 80 eighth grade students mm. where they actually, we gave them uh, 45 different tables, small tables. Uh, of data sets is a fancy word for it, but small tables. And it could be, you know, it could be around what is the most popular albums in the last few years. It could be around Netflix shows. It could be around sports. It could be around uh, uh, crime rates in different cities. It could hmm. be around homelessness, pollution. So we gave them this whole uh, range of data sets. And an important part of Problem Solvers Lab is that they have choice, right? So they chose the data set that really spoke to them. Mm. Then they explored what that issue is. Mm. And then they thought about in this data set, what's like the most important things that I want to highlight and bring to the world. And then they followed like an art process 
Hmm. Most of this activity was actually driven by the art teacher who were in the classroom. We just created the structure so that we collaborated with her so that she can actually deliver it. So then they thought about what is the medium we are going to use? What are some of the symbols we are going to use? And based on that, they then created an art project. So let me just share with you what their uh, ultimate uh, mm -hmm. this looks like. So uh, I'll show you. So there is this created with cardboard and clay, which talks about how do different countries in the world dispose plastic waste. Mm -hmm. And so typically with this picture would be like the table and the commentary by the artist. This is about different art, uh, music artists and representing the top five artists. And these pictures represent a symbols for those artists, right? This is like beautiful. This is where mm -hmm. a student really struggles, really struggles, not just in math, but in every subject, right? Uh, this is homelessness in the US. Right? And each one of those sticks represent 5,000 people. And this really brings very starkly what is the homelessness problem uh, in the US. This uh, is households with child abuse and so on and murder rates. So it can get very dark to very uh, interest, uh, you know, light. But it depends on what students want to bring in the process. There were a lot of conversations in between the students about these issues, right? Mm -hmm. And very so these uh, conversations were not curated; these were happening. Yeah. I remember the conversation I had with an eighth grade student, a boy, about abortion rights, right? Because one of the uh, data sets was on opinions about abortion in different countries of the world, right? Huh. So. So this is one pro uh, one project that we did. The other project we are just kicking off this Saturday with Akanksha students, mm -hmm. where they will do go into the community and do a street audit okay. of potholes, trees, mm -hmm. garbage, uh, you know, uh, sidewalks, and then report back and come back and uh, create a um, a poster or a letter to the authorities saying this is the this is how different streets look like. And this is the situation. So it's again going back to very real life problems, mm. but using problem solving and uh, data and math as part of that. Yeah, that's so powerful to visceralize data rather than just visualize it. Like you bring out all those emotions, you have real conversations, and I think yeah. that gets the like we're not ignoring questions of class, caste, and all of these different issues. We're really speaking about them, bringing them up through this. And I think that's very powerful. So thank you so much. I love the word visceralize. <laughs> uh, I think visualize is important too, but I love the word visceralize is like mm -hmm. feeling it with your body, uh, exactly. experiencing it. Beautiful. I will start yeah. using it. Yes, yes, please. I actually learned it from this book called Data Feminism. Uh, mm. That's where I was introduced to the concept. It's one particular chapter called... Um, I forgot the exact name of the chapter, but it's chapter three of that book. I think I'll also share um, a link to that. It's it's publicly available online too. So that book also helped me. It, it gives a bunch of examples of how uh, data visualizations, but they've also done like some experimental versions of them. So like, yeah, very interesting examples. I'll share the link in some time, but. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also have a project that we did with Akanksha students and mm -hmm. students here in New York City called Dear Data. I'll yeah. send you the link. I had mentioned it to you. You uh, you track one week of your mm -hmm. life on a very narrow like phone usage, right? Uh, and then you, at the end of that, you like kind of analyze and synthesize it yeah. and then represent it through a visual. Correct. And it's beautiful because it leads to some reflection on how you are behaving, some real deep understanding of how you're behaving mm. on a very specific issue. Yeah, I actually have their journal. They made like this journal called uh, Observe, Visualize, something, something yes, else. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I own that. I've been using it. It's been quite incredible. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. 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 I also love how the worlds of math and art come together. Like there's no binary between like, okay, this is what art is. This is what something smart is. So there's so many different binaries that it's challenging. It, that, that always really excites me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just art, right? It's like mm. science and politics exactly. and uh, economics. Mm. All those need to come together so that you have a more complete understanding of the world. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah.
like in beginning the... problem solving is to have a good understanding of the world around you mm. that's of a good problem solver absolutely that's definitely the goal yeah thank you so much charuta i'd also like to invite some audience questions i do have a couple of questions but i also wanted to see if um, there are any questions that are burning from the audience so we can we can answer those too Yeah, thanks for that, Aditi. We'd like to invite people to put their questions on the chat or come off of mute. Uh, even if you want more explanation around mm -hmm. the concepts and the tools that Charita and Aditi discussed, whether it is low floor, high ceiling, or uh, how can you include notice and wonder in your classrooms, anything that's coming up, even if it's just clarifications, you can even use this space to ask those questions. I see Siddhanta has written to me. Siddhanta, I'm responding back to you with my email address and would love to collaborate with you. Thank you. I'm also just sharing the link to the chapter that I mentioned. But in the meantime, I think, oh yeah, sorry, Amna, go ahead. No, no, if we don't have questions, we can uh, move on with uh, the question you have for Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Uh, oh, yeah. May I? Yes, uh, yeah. Hi, this is Abha, and uh, good evening, everyone. So, first of all, of course, it was really nice. Uh, I think hearing so many things, and I think being a math educator for now almost two decades and a little bit more, and also being a teacher educator in that same field, I think it was extremely, extremely insightful, uh, you know, about some of the things that I got to know, and I think some of the strategies that I, you know, I heard about. I think amazing work being done. Uh, I just want to understand one thing, which also has been, I think, an area of concern for me to, uh, you know, and I want to ask that question here, that when we talk about abstraction, I think in a lot of, lot many places, I feel not just the teachers, uh, but otherwise, even myself, sometimes I feel struggling with the, the fact that how to uh, help in the middle school years, and especially when the children make a transition from middle school to the senior school, to make certain concepts, uh, while of course, I've been doing a lot of work around CPA, you know, helping teachers understand how to do this whole concrete pictorial abstract approach. But still somewhere I also feel a little limited in the kind of experiences I can give them with respect to, uh, you know, reinforce the fact that, yes, a lot of these abstract concepts can be done in a way where we give children uh, concrete experiences. And if not concrete, maybe a little bit more of engaging with pictorial and representational experiences. So just want to understand a little bit more how to further develop any any particular research that or search whether I can study or any particular way, how I can enhance my ability to bring that uh, in a more convincing way that, okay, yes, this can be done. Because sometimes I feel, yes, some concepts are very tough to, you know, uh, actually uh, give a very experiential, you know, experience to the children, uh, to the teachers first. And then, of course, the teachers can only then deploy it in their classroom. So, yeah, I think that's a little uh, thing I want to understand. Thank you. Uh, Abhada, you're raising a really, really important uh, question about how do we actually, um, in my mind, it is about how do we actually make knowledge more sticky, right? And how can they have, uh, yes. it, to me, what's important is for students to actually construct their own knowledge. Uh, and therefore, our job is to really create that experience where we are not telling them what the rule is or what the formula is or uh, what the function is, but they are actually coming to that conclusion by themselves, right? I had like a one, two hour, two hour, lesson with seventh graders on uh, convincing them about the rules for uh, uh, negative and positive numbers. And it was, yeah. I was just giving a bunch of experiences to them and they were, oh, so this is how the rule works. Oh, this is, and they would fight with each other. Why would it work this way? And so I think when students come up with their own uh, understanding of how the rule works, that, that is when it's most sticky. Like sure. Alicia was telling me yesterday that, you know, she was explaining something to a ninth grade student and what she found that she was explaining the logic rather than the formula, because she didn't remember the formula herself, but what she remembered was the logic behind that formula, uh, uh, behind that problem. So that's one. In terms of real life, uh, like resources, I don't know if you've heard of three act problems. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat here. No, I haven't. So it'll be really nice to share. So, uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, did you say you have uh, seen those? 
No, I'm saying I haven't. Uh, so it'll be really okay. nice if you could share that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, I put in the name three act problems. This originally started with Dan Meyer, uh, D A N M E Y E R. You should follow him and his uh, uh, blog. Stop, stop. He, he writes beautifully, but he has made a Google sheet of three act problems where the first act is you show a video or a photo, and you say what mathematical problem might we solve with this, or what what do you predict will happen. The second act is where you say, what information are you going to need to solve this problem? And the third act is where you create a model for solving the problems. And it's like on a whole range of curriculum related uh, topics, including quadratic equations where he actually throws a basketball into a, a hoop and he just right. shows the beginning and he says, what do you predict will happen? Mm -hmm. uh, will it go into the, so it's, it's, it's beautiful also because you can use it in the classroom directly related to your curriculum. And I, I would be happy to then, uh, my email address, I'm just going to drop it in uh, here. If you could just share class. that also, because maybe yeah. at some point, if there's more, I, I would say mentoring required, then we can, I can definitely would Absolutely. love to get in touch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll also, just one quick, I, I know there are other people with their hands, just one quick follow-up question, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I so yeah. while of course you were talking about constructivism and I think being a student of education for like a long time, I do completely adhere my you know affiliate myself to that kind of a pedagogy and an approach where I certainly believe. But what happens as a teacher when I walk in? Yes, I give that kind of you know uh, you know experience for my children. But when as a teacher educator you're not directly uh, interacting with the teachers, then it kind of becomes a little challenge to uh, I don't know how to say it, but yeah, be able to change that mindset and to be able to on board the teachers with that whole idea because like you said it's it's a little tough concept to and a construct to believe in because still you don't see the result so just want to quickly and maybe one or two i think pearls of wisdom from your end sense that if you're working with teachers how do you how do you bring them on board them with this idea like how do you make sure that at the end of the day there's one takeaway that yes children can construct their whole thing themselves so if, if you've ever worked with teachers closely and how have you managed to do that so i think there are two ideas that i have one is to actually create activities and provide these activities because it's very tough to it's not uh, tough to construct design activities where students can develop their own understanding so if you can start them off with a library of such activities uh, and then create lesson plans which is what we are doing we are creating detailed lesson plans that any teacher can then implement in the classroom right sure. including uh, thinking about what student misconceptions might be there what kind right. of questions you ask so yeah. that would be one for me mm -hmm. the best form of professional development has been when somebody has actually worked with me in the classroom right, right. Uh, i know it requires a lot of investment but mm. that's been for me the best, even like um, uh, best form of uh, de uh, professional development where we're focusing on uh, some narrow sets of skills where the my coach has come into the classroom, observed me, but and also demonstrated. And then next, uh, next best form of professional development is where the teacher is treated as a learner. Where and right. which is how we do our training sessions, where we first do the activities with the teachers as if they are the students and they go through the uh, motions of like actually solving the problem, creating the artifact. And then we reflect back, we step back and say, uh, what teacher moves did we make to reach XYZ goals? I think those are. Yeah. Uh, and we can talk further about this. Uh, uh, we yeah. can connect offline. Thank you Absolutely. so much. This was really helpful. Thanks, Tata. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Ambika, looks like you had a question. I'm not sorry. I'm breaking rules in terms of who I'm calling, but. <laughs> uh, Ambika, you're on mute. Sorry. All right. Is that better? <laughs> Uh, thank you. I first of all want to say this has been a wonderfully inspiring session. I have so many ideas now that I just want to run with. Um, I wanted to ask you, I am involved with a learning center uh, in rural UP. And our popu student population is, I would say, mostly illiterate. Um, and so we are working on foundational literacy. 
And of course, all of those children can problem solve. But I'd love to, if you can address or share more thoughts about given the fact that they don't know how to read yet uh, and don't know how to do the basic math operations, how does that change your framing and approach, if at all? Uh, what are your thoughts about? And I, I should say this is a, a it's um, a rural, a very rural population of um, mostly children of subsistence farmers. So, yeah. I can think of uh, three things. By the way, Amrita, the fact that students don't read exists even in seventh grade. Just to let you know, because I worked with seventh graders here in New York City. Instructions, but no, that doesn't happen, right? So you have to assume that students are not going to read a whole lot and they're even going to write even less, write even less. So then how do we actually get over that, right? So a few things that I can think of and we can talk more later is one is games. Games can be explained verbally. And uh, if you can have simple games that just need some stones, just need some beans, right? And there is a whole lot of games out there. I don't know if you have heard of uh, 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 Ben Orlin. I can, no. uh, uh, he's written a book called Math with Bad Drawings because they're literally bad drawings. Uh, but he's also written a game, a book called Math Games with Bad Drawings. Okay. All the games in his book uh, are with very little setup. Is just paper and pen or some counters, which in our context, we can use beans, right? Or what I did with Nim right now, we just draw. Yeah. Right? So games is definitely one way of, and you introduce the game, they play with it, but then through that, they de uh, develop strategies, right? Uh, and then they might end up doing some math part of that, but now they have actually have motivation to do that math, right? Yeah. Uh, and not just because a teacher is teaching. The other is puzzles. Uh, both visual puzzles and verbal puzzles. You know, we did the farmer, wolf, cabbage, and uh, farmer, wolf, sheep, cabbage problem. You know, you can take only one thing at a time across, uh, and but the wolf will eat the uh, go goat, and the goat will eat the cabbage, yeah. and then see and leave it to them to see how are you going to uh, build this. But then, once you come up with the solution, how are you going to draw to make your thinking visible? So to make thinking visible doesn't have to be in writing, doesn't have to be formulas. It can be drawing, right? Drawing is very powerful. It can be acting. What moves the farmer is going to make, can you act it out? So that to me is the third. Second, the third is there are a lot of like these visual pattern kind of uh, uh, problems. You know, like a growing pattern where you start with one dot, then there are five dots, then there are nine dots, then 13 dots. And this is all you're doing is giving them a visual pattern and then engaging in what are you not just starting with what do you notice and what do you wonder, right? Mm -hmm. I'm noticing that there are lots of dots. That's a noticing, right? And so you start off with the notice and wonder routine, which is very accessible for everybody and can be done verbally. And then you can actually teach them to make tables, right? Oh, you're noticing there's one, then there's five, then nine. Can you predict what, can you draw what third and the fourth will look like? Can you now predict what the fifth will look like? Can we draw a table and see what pattern we are noticing? So yeah. visual patterns are great for students who uh, are struggling with both math and English. Yeah. This is very helpful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I had one small thought to add to that. I'm sure they also have a bunch of games that they grew up with. Like they play, they, they've been playing their whole. So you can also try to connect those because I think India has a very rich history of yeah. um, these yeah. lovely games. Like I've right. grown up around so many card games and yeah, that would also be very interesting to do, I think. Yeah, right. absolutely. I think cards is like a, such a powerful mm -hmm. way to learn uh, both math and strategy and problem solving. Right. Yeah. Ambika, is that a real plant behind you? It is. <laughs> Beautiful. I love Loving plants. <laughs> it is. It's happy <laughs> for once. <laughs> thanks for that, Ambika. And thanks for answering Ambika's question. Do we have any more questions from the audience? 
or sparks that you just want to share if something's really inspiring you also you can just come off of you Oh, while we wait for a question, I also wanted to add that I think movement is one thing that also transcends language. That's also something I've been exploring and it's still coming up. So like the intuit, that's something that's been really exciting for me with flow arts. I don't really have to teach kids like they intuitively get things. They themselves figure out the micro adjustments. So I think those kind of object manipulation ideas, movement, dance and all of these forms could also help cross that initial barrier. I think they also come up with their own hypothesis, name things. So, yeah. <laughs> Aditi, do you have a library of such uh, movements, actions, or lessons? I'm building that... one. That's exactly my next next task now. But I'm building one, and I'm trying to map all the concepts, the activities, the games. So just like the spreadsheet that Dan Dan Maya has done, I think I want to build something like that. Beautiful. So yeah, that that will definitely. Please share it with the world as soon as you're done. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Asha, was there something you wanted to mention? I was actually curious to uh, learn uh, about some of the questions that Aditi said she had. Oh. <laughs> didn't get around. Oh, yeah. One second. Let me just pull them up and put them down. I think some of them did get answered with the two questions, but uh, yeah, also, and they also did get answered with Alicia's conversation. But I wanted, wanted to know more about the changes that you see in students once they, like the confidence that comes in with um spaces that are where they where they feel safe enough to voice their opinions but yeah I, I realized a couple of anecdotes that you mentioned especially the boy who discussed uh, different abortion rights with different countries with you so yeah but if you have any more thoughts on that theme. there is one student uh, who we worked with during summer uh you know she was good at math but she had a very strong concept of like right and wrong both mm -hmm. for process and for uh, an answer and when we gave the super stairs problem, by the way, Dan Myers has a super stairs problem. It's a 40 second video, which is the starting point of uh, a, a pretty complex problem, right? And uh, it was fascinating to see how she struggled with it at the beginning. Uh, the idea that, Achha, is my answer right? Is my answer right? And she wouldn't otherwise talk unless she was absolutely sure that her answer is right. Then we went through a process where students actually had to run up and down stairs, mimicking what Dan uh, was doing, come up with some hypothesis. Uh, everybody had to state some hypothesis about like oh, uh, what the answer might be. At the end of it, her reflection was, I thought that it is bad to make mistakes in math. Now I think that making mistakes is an integral part of problem solving. And so mm -hmm. I swear, those are her words that she is used, that it is like an important, essential part of problem solving. I think that's like the biggest shift that we want to see, that you're not stuck with one way, but you're actually open to, I don't even call them mistakes. Those are experiments that you conduct. You take what the learnings are from the experiments, let go of what didn't work, and then build on what worked. And mm. do that with confidence mm. and do that with joy. Uh, that's 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 the shift mm -hmm. that we are slowly seeing in students. Those take a lifetime to learn. So I'm actually really impressed and like happy that those kids have come to those conclusions on their own and they're actually embodying it too. Yeah, quite amazing. No, absolutely. And you're right that it is multiple of such experiences that will actually reinforce and then mm -hmm. become community. One experience is enough to create a spark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, might not be enough for it to stay as a habit. Get it. Yeah. I think we have a question from Murtaza. Uh, Swello's puzzle experiment talks about students able to solve puzzles, but unable to relate the pattern. So how can we bring that insight in students, especially with math? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I think breaking up the problem into small parts, and I'm not sure I completely have the answer. But mm. what I'll tell you what we have done, right? Uh, we worked with, I don't know if you guys have heard with uh, about Tower of Hanoi. Mm. It's a puzzle mm. right, where you have to move discs from one peg to the first peg to the third peg. And there are seven discs. And making the problem smaller, mm. which means starting with one disc, then two discs, then three discs. Mm. And then organizing your information with small set of uh, uh, numbers 
to then see what is the pattern that's emerging. When it's too much, it becomes overwhelming. But when there is only three or four rows, right? You can start thinking about what is the pattern that's emerging. You can also start predicting. And with the prediction, then the next time you do it, either your prediction is correct or it's wrong. If it's wrong, then you have a new set of information with which you can make a fresh prediction. Hmm. So uh, Murtaza, that is kind of the process that we have followed for students to uh, decode how a puzzle would work. And it also becomes a great way of them then making the thinking visible as to, hey, we started off like this and this is how the pattern that we notice. <coughs> okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Arshia. Mm -hmm. I, Thanks I, so much, Arshia. I want to tell you about, I know we are out of time. Our experience was one of the facilitators had while traveling back from Lonavla to, uh, to Pune in a, uh, a train, he, he gave the problem of inverting the triangle. You know, you have 10 pennies in four rows, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so 10 pennies. And your job is in the minimum of number of moves of moving the pennies, you have to invert the triangle and make it face down instead of face up. Yeah? And he started off with his colleagues. Soon there were five other passengers <laughs> jumped in and wanted to play this and were figuring out patterns that even Rajat had not noticed. And eventually were figuring out, you know, how could this problem be solved? Mm. So I, I thought that was such a beautiful moment. Love it. Love it. Thanks for that, Charlotte. And I think the passion that both of you really have for what you're doing really shows in every conversation, in every uh, uh, piece of question that you were answering I think that is really one of the most uh, humbling things and we are so excited that you came on board to do this I for a fact know that we'll be hearing from you working with you quite a bit throughout the year so uh, we'd love to know how the attendees can stay in touch with you I know Charita you've put in your email ID Aditi how can people stay in touch with you we'll send in the contact info in the follow-up uh, email yeah. that goes to everyone but once again, to all the attendees, thank you so much for joining in and engaging and to Charuta and Aditi. We're so grateful that you took this uh, time, structured a beautiful, very engaging session for us. Uh, very happy that you did this. And uh, to everyone, before you leave, uh, Suhani will just put in the feedback form link again. If you could just fill that before heading out, that would be really helpful. And uh, we have an exciting five-week cohort-based program called the Starter Program, whose applications are open right now now if you're interested in learning what does it mean to reinvent schools that's a great uh, program to join in if you visit our website that's the first thing that you will see on the uh, landing page so take it's a small application that you'll have to fill out so just these two forms two links for you to keep a note of we'll be in touch uh, we keep doing these forums every other week so uh, watch out uh, this space our website our whatsapp group to keep in touch with all the programming Yes, the feedback form is really important. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great uh, rest of the evening. Uh, a very happy Independence Day uh, to all of you. And see you all back in the space very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much.